All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Women in Real World Analytics uh, Leadership Forum. So tonight's talks have been organized by the Women of Odyssey Group, or WOO, as we are affectionately known. <laughs> <laughs> So WU kicked off earlier this year uh, with the aim of providing a forum for women to come together and discuss the challenges that they face as women working in real world analytics. So we aim to facilitate conversations where women can share their perspectives, raise concerns, and uh, propose ideas on how the Odyssey community can promote female researchers and data scientists. And ultimately, WU aims to inspire women to become leaders within the Odyssey community and their respective fields. So while this is the Women's Leadership Forum, tonight's event is all about promoting and encouraging those typically underrepresented in science to become leaders within the scientific community and ensure that clinical research is informed by a diverse range of perspectives. So tonight is all about celebrating leadership and also illuminating the complex landscape that individuals from underrepresented groups have to navigate as they progress through their careers. And since this is the Women in Real World Analytics Leadership Forum, we're also going to touch on the intersection between improving inclusiveness and the shift in healthcare research towards personalized precision medicine. <coughs> Uh, over the past few years, there's been a real palpable drive to create opportunities that will ensure that all voices are heard and represented uh, throughout the research process. Because having that diverse range of viewpoints is how we will develop a deeper understanding of personal health and shed new light on diseases and treatments. So with that, I'm incredibly excited to welcome our speakers for tonight. So first up, we have Dr. Noemi El Haddad an associate professor of biomedical informatics at the Columbia University Irvine Medical Center. Noemi is also <laughs> affiliated with the Computer Science Department and the, and the Columbia Data Science Institute and serves as the acting chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics, or DBMI, at Columbia. Between 2013 and 2016, Noemi served as chair of the Health Analytics Center at the Columbia Data Science Institute, and she is now the graduate program director at DBMI. Dr. El Haddad's work takes place at the intersection of machine learning, natural language processing, and medicine. She investigates ways in which observational clinical data, such as electronic health records, and patient-generated data, such as mobile health data, can enhance access to relevant information for clinicians, patients, and healthcare researchers. Noemi leads the Citizen Endo Project, which works to bridge the gap between how doctors think about endometriosis as a disease and how and the ways patients with endometriosis experience the disease on a daily basis. And this year, she started EVAN, which is a research initiative on data-powered women's health. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Noemi El Haddad. Looking for my slides, hold on. It only one, uh, this one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Noemi. Thank you so much, Maura, for your introduction. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about women being a woman and leadership. So I first want to thank Maura and all the organizers of WU uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk. I think it's amazing that this is happening at Odyssey. And I want to start with a little caveat, which is that I'm sure as many of you in this audience, um, you know, I have experience. I also have witnessed a lot of really frustrating events uh, and about implicit or explicit biases against different types of groups, including women. And I've had many, many conversations with my peers <coughs> about the type of no-win situation some of us can be in sometimes uh, when we present our work or when we try to become leaders in this field, but what to do, strategies to cope, etc. cetera. Uh, but I don't want to talk about any of this today. I want to really think about thoughts about leadership, really. Uh, and I'm going to start with my first point, which is that supportive role models and mentors make a difference. And so I'm 
I'm obviously going to be using some of my personal uh, life examples. Uh, and the first thing I'll say is that it takes a village to raise a scientist. Uh, and these are some of the important people in my life. So I did my PhD in computer science. And uh, my advisor, Kathy McKeon, uh, was really a fearless leader. She, had, uh, she was chair at the time that I joined her lab. She had a, one of the largest number of grants in the School of Engineering. She was also the first professor at Columbia University who had three children during her ch tenure uh, process, and that was a big deal at the time. So she, you know, as she raised me as a scientist, I was extremely lucky to have her as a mentor as well. Uh, and I'll just give one anecdote here, which is on the last year of my PhD, I was pregnant and was about to have my child. And uh, the computer science department said, well, she would have to take a whole year off, because how could she do research and have a child at the same time? And uh, my advisor made me not do it. And in fact, I was able to graduate and go on to be a faculty later on. And I was extremely grateful for this. Uh, there are other people in there that helped me be a good scientist. Uh, and you know, some were my peers, and some were other people that I just found by myself in my department and outside. But the point is that you know, there was this uh, atmosphere that my advisor had put into our lab, which was fairly large, that enabled us to really feel like we could do anything. And that was extremely useful. Uh, when I became a faculty, it took even more mentors to help me uh, go on being a successful uh, scientist. I couldn't help but find that picture of George in here, <laughs> <laughs> of all the pictures out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you all recognized him. I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, my, my mentor, my PhD advisor, stayed my mentor up to this day. You know, whenever she emails me, I respond within 30 seconds. And, uh, and I really go to her for any of my issues. One more. Um, one more anecdote, which is as I was a, as I was a faculty going through tenure, uh, George was really the one who supported me in terms of how to be different, right? So I was a computer scientist who had joined an informatics department. And at the time, it's, uh, I think it was a very different uh, situation where data science, computer science, machine learning were not exactly yet fully embraced by the entire field. And it was really George's support that helped me figure out, OK, this is actually a strength. I don't have to overcome the fact that I'm a computer scientist in a multidisciplinary world, but rather I can you know, you know, be proud about this, be fearless about this, and play it as a strength. Um, so again, supportive role models, it makes a difference. They come in many forms. They can be your peers. They can be your mentors. You have to seek them if you don't have a natural type of network available to you. And really what it taught me was to be fearless. I think that's really the main uh, thing, in addition to all the things related to science, like you know, be rigorous and all of these things. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, as I grew my lab, and these are my PhDs and my postdocs and some core members of my lab here, um, it became very obvious that diversity was really the secret sauce here. Uh, as I learned, you know, from different students one after the other, there was this interesting phenomenon where I realized, oh, they each have a very different point of view. They all come for very different types of training, experiences, narrative about their personal lives that are really shaping the way they see their contribution to science. And uh, I found that very, very exciting. So all of this diversity, in, again, like in the case of my tenure, where being different from a traditional informaticist made me actually be a, you know, a positive for my tenure case. Um, all of this diversity of my labs, uh, I thought, was actually the secret sauce to innovation. And we were able, in my lab, to think about questions that others were not thinking about, to test assumptions about the world, all of these things that we think are true but are, in fact, not true 
true because we haven't seen it from a different standpoint. What was also interesting is they themselves encouraged me to think even more about my own diversity. And again, in a multidisciplinary environment, it's very easy to be diverse. Everyone, in fact, is diverse. Uh, and so I got started into this whole uh, personal journey of taking my own experience as a patient of a chronic disease that was not well understood scientifically and deciding once and for all I could actually do research on this. I don't have to, again, overcome it and think of ways to not use it in my professional life. Instead, I might have something interesting to say as a scientist, um, but also as a patient. And so I started uh, reading all sorts of new things. This is my... Uh, kind of like, you know, if you have one minute to learn about women's health and implicit biases, look, read that seminal paper called The Girl Who Cried Pain, A Bias Against Women in the Treatment of Pain. If you have a little bit more time, I really encourage you to read this book, which uh, despite its, uh, you know, sensitizing uh, title is actually quite scientific in nature and really gives a very nice overview of all the implicit biases in women's health that uh, one could be thinking about in research. So I built, as Maura mentioned, this uh, project called Citizen Endo. And you know, very quickly, the idea is let's ask patients of endometriosis directly for their experience of endo, and let's build a data set that hasn't been collected before, which is day-to-day -day experiences of disease combined with other whatever we can get from these patients and from their electronic <laughs> health records. And by having this new data, we can start thinking about the disease differently. And uh, what we found is that, in fact, the data that the patients were telling us was quite different and way more, way richer than what we could find in observational health data sets like electronic health records available to us at the time. And so through this project, we started doing more and more reaching out to patients. Uh, we are doing in our group a lot of uh, activities and education to different types of populations. So this is me doing a kind of a advocacy uh, Instagram campaign for uh, awareness of endometriosis. We did a lot of uh, AMAs, which means ask me anything on Reddit. And we got a lot of press, which I think is a good way to reach different people. But really what gets me the most excited is that we got a lot of good science out of this. <laughs> and so these are just three examples. You know, you wouldn't, if you were to read the titles, I guess my point in showing this paper, others and advertise about my papers, is um, that you wouldn't know that it comes from someone who's a patient, right? You wouldn't know that it's, you know, it took me years to think, is this a good idea to do this? Like, do I really, am I biased because I'm a patient? Am I biased because I'm a woman and I think about women's health? At the end of the day, you end up doing good science that would not have been done if I hadn't, you know, being fearless like my mentors had taught me. Um, so the last thing I wanna add is, okay, so diversity brings innovation, that's wonderful, and I highly encourage you to do it, but the way to do, to have diversity is really to be inclusive. Um, and it's, uh, it sounds obvious. Yes, all the leaders in the room are like, yep, thank you. Um, <laughs> and to which I will say, yes, it's obvious. And yet it's not happening yet. Uh, there's no standard, there's no course on how to be inclusive. You know, beyond my lab, in my, in my uh, duties as graduate program director, the same questions of inclusivity happen. As an interim chair, the same questions of inclusivity happen. Uh, I think it's a general practice, like you have to uh, strengthen that muscle of inclusivity over and over, but it really pays off in the type of innovation and science that you can do. So until there is uh, actual standards and best practices out there, you know, what I would encourage you all to do is to talk to each other and really try to find a way to incorporate it into your own um, leadership experience. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop, thank you. All right, thank you for that, Noemi. So next up, we have 
Dr. Violanda Grigorescu, who is Chief of the Partnerships and Evaluation Branch in the Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Laboratory Services at the Center for Disease Control. Uh, Dr. Grigorescu has been with the CDC since 2011 and has served as Chief of the Partnerships and Evaluation Branch since 2015. Uh, as branch chief, she has been strategic, innovative, and instrumental in planning and increasing the branch's capacity to bring new data sources to the CDC and use evolving analytic technology. And one of the major initiatives that have been successful under her leadership is the CDC's Data Hub. Uh, so Dr. Grigorescu has many years of public health experience as an epidemiologist and leader, and she has held different positions at the local, state, and federal level that have broadened her horizon and expertise in public health. She is a pioneer in data linkages and a champion in implementing complex public health programs and surveillance systems in collaboration with colleagues from healthcare and academia. Uh, she has conducted many epidemiology studies that inform decision making and has published in numerous peer reviewed journals. In addition, Dr. Grigorescu brings to public health a rich clinical background from her many years of practice as an OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist in different European healthcare systems, including both government subsidized and private clinics. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Violanda Grigorescu. Thank you. Thank you very much to RDC community. Thank you, Tamara, for organizing this. Um, as I was listening to Naomi and to this introduction, um, it reminded me that I used to say to everyone that I had two lives. So I had my life when I was in clinical practice, and I've done many things in Europe, and then I came here and I work in public health. But Naomi reminded me, actually, that I had in my life mentors throughout women. When I had my MD thesis, he was a woman who was my mentor. Um, when I was doing my reproductive endocrinology in England, it was a woman who was my mentor. When I moved in public health, I actually threw out, I had above me managers who were women. And even now I report to a woman. My division director is a woman. So um, even though uh, some of them were actually in tandem with other men who were giants in the field and doing fantastic work, I still think of them, women who were for me a model. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Today I'm going to walk you a little bit at a faster pace, like in agile environment era, throughout public health, because I don't know how many of you uh, were engaged or know enough about public health. Um, my life has been in public health for the past almost 20 years. So even though I was in public health, I always look for innovation or things like we can do to bring the research and innovation to public health. So I'm going to share with you a few things today. Um, first of all, I should say um, I, always, I always thought and I believe that there are lessons to learn from the past. There are accomplishments and moments of today that we should be proud of and seize. And then there, are, there is always a vision that we aim to achieve in the future. So then since I'm a leader and I always thought how to engage my um, people, my mentees, my staff in the branch, I always thought that I have to bring something back to make a connection and to energize by saying that we are not here by chance alone and we are here because we had to be here. So um, Einstein doesn't need any introduction, but I put this up because he has an, had an influence on the philosophy of science as well. And I think this quote stands true regardless what time we live in, regardless what we do. The significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. So then taking this, um, I was looking to what iterative processes we are aware of, because we live in this era of agile environment and iterative processes. Is this new? So I, I had my own training in implementation science back a few years ago, only because it is, uh, impressed me actually, and I found that being the best way to expedite the way we actually translate science into medicine. And as you know, uh, as we started to use electronic medical records, that raised the bar. So we had to learn faster, we had to translate faster. And that's when KT knowledge translation came to exist. It has different names and then it was changed to implementation science. I don't know how many of you read, there are different frameworks. This is one I used in the past. I even didn't go to Toronto to learn from KT because that was the knowledge, you know, knowledge translation born. And there's a lot of collaboration with NIH, but that actually I think influenced the field to think we cannot take that much time 
from research to translation if we'd like to make a difference. And then, of course, technology came with a Scrum complex uh, framework. And Scrum is meant actually to be a framework for complex processes and knowledge in a matrix environment. And it has been used more for software development, but actually in these days is used for any other kind of activities and, and processes. So without thinking much about this prior iterative processes and framework, I was the one you know, charged or asked to take the data hub at CDC to another level. It's an iterative process in itself. And we started with basic things, how we acquire, how we have a process that we can acquire external data sources that can actually complement public health. But then it, it evolved actually from that simple acquisition to thinking more of data science, thinking how we're going to consolidate the use of multiple data sources to help the agency you know, make progress. And, it, and if you ask me, you know, for instance, how these EMRs can be used for public health, you know, I can give you first a list of many data sources that we acquire and how can we actually come up with different studies thinking of how can I use American hospital surveys, for instance, linked to claims. Then I can develop a study question thinking of, you know, patients receiving um, uh, Medicare or Medicaid and what hospitals they are in. And I can go on and on with different study objectives or questions. But then we had to acquire EMRs, of course. And we had commercial claims, and we had government. We still have an acquire all these data sources and we continue expanding as much as possible. Now, of course, we live in this era. Everything is changing as we speak, and we will have to adjust. But then today, for instance, I was at the phenotyping um, seminar in the morning or uh, workshop in the morning, and it was great to see how much innovation is behind the use of different tools to enhance our ability in interrogating different data sources. So it's a lot waiting for us in the future. But then again, if you ask me how we use this um, medical records, let's say for public health, I put this use cases only as a, you know, like a, for you to understand is above and beyond what I put on this slide. But talking about the workshops this morning, talking about how we develop case algorithms, phenotype, how we are um, planning to use this for public health use, which is slightly different when it comes to this high level population, when we have to share with people and say this has an impact at the population level versus one clinical network. It's a little sl slightly different perspective and requires different kind of approaches. But it's important. It's very important to take whatever research you come up with and elevate and take this at a scale up at the level of public health. So then we talk about this big data and real world evidence. And as I was thinking of my presentation actually, and I was reading a few things, I found this paper published in New England Journal of Medicine and actually from colleagues from FDA who are talking about real world evidence. How important is the context in which we think of this real world evidence? So then, of course, it's the same thing. We need to have meaningful questions. We need to fit the purpose, and we need to validate the findings. But I took this because the context in which I have to implement all of this is public health. And I don't know how many of you ever saw before the framework of public health that actually has three key functions, assessment, assurance, and policy development. Under all these three functions, there are 10 essential services. And in the core of this is research, seeking innovative approaches to apply to public health and to improve public health, and thinking of the complexity of issues that we face today. So it's not new, even though you may not hear about this framework, because you know we keep changing and we keep thinking of new uh, ideas, new innovative things coming our way. This is still at the basis of things we do today in public health. And then I was reading the CDC blog, actually, written by a um, doctoral student, Behavior Sciences and Health Education Department at Emory University in Atlanta. And it's pretty good, actually. Um, and I'm going to have to read how she defined. I really like how she defined. She defined precision medicine as an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in environmental lifestyle and genes for each person. True. But she defined public health as the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities, and individuals. If you think of this, it's actually an intersection between the two. So she called it public precision public health, a field focused on providing the right intervention to the right population at the right time. 
not new, not new concept to public health. We actually have an office of genomics at CDC and we collaborate and we work with them and try to think now how to apply different things we brought through Data Hub. But I like that this is a call to young researchers to actually think above and beyond how can we use precision medicine for public health. And I think it's important because we'll speak for the same um, complexity of public health problems and addressing equity in services that people receive and outcomes they have to achieve. So I put this, you can check actually the blog, I put a link on this one if, you know, if this will be shared with anyone. But then it goes back to us, women in the room, women in leadership, women in big data, science and technology management and leadership. I don't know how many of you um, had the chance to see this uh, YouTube video, A Tale of Two Brains. It's, it's a funny way of saying the difference between two brains, but it's biological correct, actually, how much the interaction between the two hemispheres in women go horizontally very fast compared to men with a more horizontal, but actually they complement whenever they work with one another. So I think the idea behind it is pretty neat, actually, how the two brains, men and women, can actually together come up with this fantastic ideas and research. So I encourage you to watch. It's funny, actually, to watch this video. <laughs> But then, of course, we live these uh, days, data science. Everybody talk about data science. I found different definitions. I truly believe still is a team concept with different people having different knowledge. However, I found this definition of the unicorn, someone who actually is going to be the one knowing everything, which it may be in the future. I truly believe who is a team still work, because if you like to develop true skills, you'll have to be in one of these interesting you know, parts of the diagram. But it's interesting, and I believe women can be unicorns. But then it took me also to how from that level you actually can become a leader. And I think a leader today is not necessarily only the captain of the ship. I think is actually the one who knows how to coach and play at the same time. In other words, be a player, work with your people, which I do every day and I learn regardless, you know, how much I was learning in my life, I'm still learning. To encourage people to be able to coach and then whenever is need, you know, I have to take my hat of a captain and I move to that role. But I think it's important to keep in mind how lead, what leadership means today. And I believe women can do this, actually. So, nobody in this world lived by being somebody else. Everybody make a mark on its own, one way or another. And I think it's important for each and every one of us to think what mark can we make to this world. What I put here on the slide are things like everybody knows and do today, but I think are equally important to be innovative, to be ready for challenges, to have the ability actually to find solutions and not to see issues or not to be afraid of any challenges that you may face to be willing to learn constantly and to apply right away, to have this flexibility that you have to adopt, adjust, and adapt. These actually are parts of implementation science. To be honest and transparent, to trust your own, in your own ability, to respect others and yourself, and to be you is just a different era. It's a faster pace, we have to do different things, but it's still us, each of us can still make the same mark. And I cannot close by not having another woman quote saying the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And each of us has dreams. And as a group and together, we can make this, bring, this dream even bigger. And I should say, I have known RDC community for about two years now. I have always been impressed about the innovation, the enthusiasm, the energy behind it, and I think there is way to go. So thank you and congratulations for what you have done today. Thank you for that, Violanda. So our next speaker is Dr. Janet Woodcock, the director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, at the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Dr. Woodcock has been with the FDA since 1986, and in that time has spearheaded an impressive list of initiatives aimed at keeping the FDA regulatory process the gold standard for drug approval and safety. 
Uh, some of these initiatives include the Pharmaceutical Quality for the 21st Century Initiative, which served to modernize drug manufacturing and regulation, the Critical Path Initiative, designed to streamline medical discoveries from the laboratory to consumers more efficiently, and most recently, Dr. Woodcock has launched the New Drug Regulatory Program Modernization Initiative, which works to enhance the new, drug, new drugs regulatory program by promoting integrated and interdisciplinary assessments and improving communication about the basis for new drugs, for new drug approvals. Uh, Dr. Woodcock has led CEDAR as director from 1994 to 2005, and from 2005 to 2008, she served as the FDA's deputy commissioner and chief medical officer. And in 2015, Dr. Woodcock held the role of acting director of Cedar's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Um, so everyone, please welcome Dr. Janet Woodcock. Well, good evening. I'm really delighted to be here. I've just always loved the uh, energy and odyssey and the huge collaboration that's going on. I think you're accomplishing great things, and uh, I really look forward to for FDA being the recipient of these that can help us. We're always in an information shortage um, in medicine, and uh, the more we can learn uh, more eff effectively and efficiently, the better off everybody's going to be. So I was kind of asked to talk a little bit about my leadership experience and, and how this might relate to, to women in this field. You know, I've always worked in male-dominated fields. I got an undergraduate degree in chemistry at a time when women didn't do that. <laughs> and um, then I went to med school, and that was when they were just admitting deliberately more women, and that was quite a revolution, and was there were some interesting times there. Um, then I was the chief resident in medicine at um, Penn State, and my daughter tells me they have a picture there, and they say, first woman chief resident, <laughs> like this was something really amazing or something. And, and at those times, I never did have uh, any female mentors because, you know, there was sort of a shortage of women in those fields. Um, when I came to FDA, though, I worked um, Jane Haney was commissioner for a while, and she was just fabulous. She's my favorite commissioner. <laughs> and um, she was really a mentor to me and very helpful to me. And I, um, uh, you know, I, that really did make a difference. Now, the good news is I think, you know, looking at the faces in this room, a lot has changed since that time. Um, and certainly my the own organization I work at, CEDAR, we have, uh, we kind of, people from NIH were talking to us and they were saying, well, we have difficulty like making sure we have enough women. And I'm there, no, we have difficulty making sure we have enough men. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So we have a lot of women executives in the ranks now. Um, so uh, that, you know, I think uh, in general, uh, we have, for example, the Center for Drugs is an extremely diverse um, uh, organization and it's very common and very much fun that you're sitting in the cafeteria and there are conversations going on in multiple different languages around you. It's so interesting. So, um, but I've had a lot of experience um, in much of my early career for a very long time of sort of being overlooked, you might say, or my opinions not being taken into account. Not only am I female, but I'm actually very short. <laughs> and so now in orientation at Cedar, I tell the people, I don't know whether they obey me or not, but I say, tell them I'm really tall. <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't seem to, uh, you know, sway anyone. Um, but I, I do have a lot of thoughts about leadership. I mean, I think what, what I did coming through all this, first of all, you know, it's inevitable that people are going to not listen to your ideas when you're junior, what, no matter what your sex might be or how tall or short you are or whatever. And so you just have to kind of persist, I think. And, and I agree with what was just said. You have to be true and trust yourself. That's really important. Um, but to do that, you have to have a lot of characteristics that enable you to be authentic and to trust yourself. I do think that um, issue of 
openness and, um, and transparency, openness to new ideas and honesty is very important. If you're gonna trust your own ideas, you, know, you just don't wanna be just somebody's pushing ideas. Um, so what, how, you know, I'm asked to give talks about leadership a lot. And I always tell people, you know, the real thing about leaders in my mind, they may not be the boss, okay? But you can recognize a leader, and why? Because they're going somewhere. That's the quintessential point about a leader. They're going somewhere, they know where they're going. It might be a project, you're the leader on a project because you have an idea, a vision, a dream, whatever, of what that project might be. And also, you recognize leaders, because a lot of people have dreams. Leaders have followers. <laughs> so they're going somewhere and people are going with them there. And you're able to do that by talking people into your point of view. And you do that by listening to their point of view. I mean, that's sort of the fundamental point, I think, of leadership is you understand where other people are coming from and you uh, are able to bring people together and to convince them about a direction. Usually, you know, like I was um, sort of helping with OMOP when it started, which was the predecessor to Odyssey, right? And I'm not an epidemiologist, and I didn't know anything about that, really, except I knew that I felt observational studies were really unsatisfactory, okay? And so <laughs> I did have that strong conviction, right? And so, um, but, you know, we got together people who really had wonderful ideas, and we all listened to each other, and we let the people who um, really, you know, had ideas of what to do move that project along. And, you know, those people kind of caught fire. My role there wasn't really to anything to lead the project, but to buy into that belief and raise the money <laughs> so that project could get done, right? So, um, you know, uh, it's really, uh, to be a leader, uh, you really do. I agree with what was just said. You have to be flexible and agile. You have to understand what your best role might be in the given situation and adapt to that. So um, there's a lot of kind of transactional stuff, figuring out what's going on in the room and then, and then kind of pulling it all together. Um, <clears throat> it's really important, and I think women, from probably from social pressures, um, are better at this in general. They don't necessarily put themselves uh, first, okay, in a project. That puts other people off. And so it's hard to lead if, it's hard to be a leader, it's hard to follow a leader who you think they're in it for themselves, right? Because you have to put yourself in the other people's mind. You're in it for the team, right? And you'll get, you know, you'll get a lot more coming together if, if you have that, um, that approach. Um, it's collaboration. Uh, science is very competitive, right? But at the end of the day, we're going to make our best progress with collaboration, not with competition. I just gave a big lecture on that <laughs> out in LA, and everybody was there, oh, because, you know, even in medical science and biomedical science, I just don't believe. I, I think we've reached a tipping point. We're not going to advance unless we have big collaborative science. You know, it, reductionist science worked for a long time because we didn't know anything about biology and we could go down into one pathway and one little piece. And we could study that and get a paper in cell and a paper in nature, right? But that doesn't cure anybody. <laughs> and to bring all that knowledge together, we have to come back up to the level of the whole organism in the society, and we really have to look at things more holistically. And that's going to take a lot of team science and collaboration. So I think we're at a point now where um, the people with those skill sets uh, are going to really shine. But I think it's going to be a hard uh, hard road to hoe because everyone, academia, and the pharmaceutical industry, <laughs> um, and the peer review system at NIH, everybody's been socialized to that individual um, achievement. And tenure and promotion, all these things are all set up that way. It's changing, but these things take a long time to change. But those 
skills, I think, are really going to help. There are other personal characteristics, I think, some of which have already been mentioned, that are really, really important. Um, leaders really have to have personal integrity. Um, again, you're not going to follow somebody you think is going to stab you in the back, right? And leaders have followers. They inspire trust by giving trust, right, and by being honest. Um, curiosity and drive is important. None of you would be in this room, though, if you don't have those things, right? You want to do science, but you need to maintain that openness and curiosity. It's just amazing how things, when you really look into them, they aren't at all like they seem. We've actually learned <laughs> what was taught, what you just talked about. At FDA, we're having patient-focused drug development because it turns out, <laughs> and frankly, this is another one of my brainstorm ideas some time ago, you know, what uh, the patients think is burdensome about their disease. It's not what the doctors think is burdensome. But we aren't really serving the doctors. Whoops. <laughs> We're serving the patients. And so they, uh, we had a meeting for people with autism, and they came in, and there were a lot of um, drugs were being developed for certain repetitive behaviors that they have, uh, stimming and so forth. And they told us, well, we don't, you know, care about that. That's that makes us calmer. We do that to calm ourselves down. We want drugs that help us communicate better. <laughs> we don't want to take drugs that make other people feel better. <laughs> we want <laughs> right. <laughs> and and so that so we listen to them. Okay, we listen to the patients because they're the ones who are going to take the medicines. So um, and I do think uh, people tell me I'm. Fear, fearless. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I think that has a lot to do with not being afraid of conflict, not getting agitated about it, but understanding it's an ordinary part of life. And also, what I said earlier, trust in yourself. Make sure you've touched all the bases, understand where everyone else is coming from, but then you have to sit on your own or stand on your own position if you understand it fully. And some of this takes empathy, uh, a quality uh, that isn't necessarily emphasized in science, which is to understand where other people are coming from and to be aware of that in your, in your transactions and interactions with people. And that's something some people um, may have to practice. Some people aren't very good at that. Uh, some of my relatives, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it's something, you know, you can learn. You can learn to be mindful, to stop your thoughts and try to focus on the other person and understand where they're coming from. So for my leadership journey, I think um, I'm very happy uh, that uh, the organization I run, I think, really has come a long way in inclusion and diversity. And this next step that was just uh, mentioned about the um, uh, modernization process, where really modern science cannot be done by one group of scientists. We have to have inter not just multidisciplinary. We have to have interdisciplinary. We have to have really teamwork, uh, team science to do the assessments and evaluations we do. And we've got a way to go, but I think we have built the foundation that we can get there. So um, I'm very happy and I've, uh, that hopefully we can serve the public even better. So thanks very much. Thank you for that, Janet. Um, so our last speaker of the evening is Dr. Joanne Wallstreicher, the Chief Medical Officer at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so in this role, Joanne has oversight across pharmaceuticals, devices, and consumer products for safety, epidemiology, clinical and regulatory operations transformation, collaborations on ethical science, technology, and R&D policies, including those related to clinical trial transparency and compassionate access. Uh, she also chairs the R&D Development Pipeline Review Committee for the Janssen Pharmaceuticals Company at Johnson & Johnson and supports the device and consumer development committees. Uh, Joanne is also a faculty affiliate of the Division of Medical Ethics within the Department of Population Health at New York University School of Medicine. And prior to joining Johnson & Johnson, Dr. Wallstreicher headed the Endocrinology and Metabolic Clinical Research 
uh, laboratories at Merck Research Laboratories, overseeing development programs in arterial sclerosis, obesity, diabetes, urology, and dermatology. Uh, as a physician and researcher, Dr. Wallstriker's passion has always driven her to work to make the world a better place through science and medicine, uh, taking what she has learned from her years serving patients uh, at the beginning of her career to working across the industry for more than 20 years. Uh, every decision she makes is rooted in science and ethics. Um, so please, everyone welcome Dr. Joanne Wallstriker. Good evening, everyone. It is so inspiring to be here to see all of you, men and women, and to be on a panel with such an esteemed group of women. I must say, it's rare for me to be on a panel with all women, right? And it must be rare for you all to see a panel of all women. I know most of the meetings I speak at, I might be one of the only women or one of only two women. And in my career, I think there are lots of women in the pharmaceutical industry or in the healthcare industry, but fewer in terms of leadership and executive leadership positions. And I think it's very, very inspiring to be here with this group tonight with you as well in the audience. And thank you, Maura, for your leadership in organizing this event. You know, science and medicine, in my view, is really at a, a pivotal moment. I think as a scientist, a physician, and a researcher, I think it's the most exciting time to be alive. Science is changing so rapidly. We are finally bearing the fruits of our genetic research. We are finally able to harness that to make a difference for people, especially people with rare diseases. Think about how great it is that we're f approaching rare diseases with these novel therapies, even before we approach common diseases. It used to be the opposite. Now we're finally unlocking some of those mysteries and we're able to bring them to patients. At the same time, there's been a revolution in patient engagement and research, which has just been amazing and inspirational. When we understand now, of course, patients know better than we do about their diseases, and I loved some of the examples that we heard tonight, but engaging them in the process of research really helps change our research for the better, and we work with patients as partners, rather treating them as patients, really partners and partners participants in the success of research and being able to change medicine. And then I think the third important pillar of the way science and medicine is changing is big data and analytics. And I'm really so proud to see the way Odyssey has progressed and the important innovations that have come out of Odyssey over the past few years. It's really amazing to see the vision come to life. And I'm really proud that we've been part of Odyssey since the start. And through this initiative, women's voices are clearly part of the solution, working together, working collaboratively with a group of diverse researchers that compromise this great Odyssey community to discuss approaches about how and where we can apply these healthcare data in entirely new ways. And for me, it's all about applying these data, really working towards that learning healthcare system that we all aspire for. For me personally, as a physician and a researcher, my passion has always driven me to strive to make the world a better place through science and medicine, and to do so with the highest standards. I did have some female role models through my career, many male role models, but probably the biggest role model for me was my father, who was a baker, who worked extremely hard throughout his life, getting up very, very early in the morning, working throughout the day, and going to sleep very early at night. We had to be very quiet when we were children. <laughs> but my father also loved science, and he always made time to sit with us. He read our textbooks. He even read my organic chemistry textbook while I was in college and medical school. He read my books and always was able to talk to me about science, about what we were learning. And my sisters here in the audience, we both are doctors. When we were on call working all night, we were up all night, 36 hour shifts, you guys know that. Um, we call our father because he was up in the bakery working and we'd have great conversations in the middle of the night. But what was really inspiring to me was that he felt very strongly about his love for science, but his drive to make the world a better place through science. And that really impacted me throughout my life. 
So I've been in pharmaceutical industry and healthcare industry for many years, I, 26 years, um, <laughs> uh, even though I'm so young. <clears throat> and um, I, I always went through my career never asking for a promotion, never asking for a different job. But several years ago, I was invited to something special at j and It was called the CEO Forum, where the CEO of the company chooses a few people. And we went away for a few days. You go away for a few days. And you bring, you have, it's not all fun and games. You have to actually write something up like what idea you would give the CEO. And so several years ago, I was invited to this. And I was, you know, I was really stressed out. And most of the other people who were there were invited were commercial people. So I'm, you know, working on this. What am I going to, you know, tell the CEO? What's my suggestion? And at the same time, um, my son was getting ready to apply to college. And I was like project manager, you know, to the nth degree, you know? <laughs> um, I had those charts out and I had boxes all over and he was a musician and we didn't really know if he was talented or not or how much, but he was determined. <laughs> and so we were applying to 20 different colleges, you know, some the low end, some the middle, some of the high, you know, based on, we didn't know where he was gonna get in. And he had to fill out applications that were not just like regular applications and essays, but if any of you have, applied to music school or know someone, I see some heads nodding. You also have to have a separate music application and separate essays and song uh, pieces that you wrote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so I was supposed to go to the CEO forum and I'm counting down with my son also the days and weeks, you know, for his applications to be due. And it became clear, even though I was so organized, it became clear that the applications were not going to be done before I had to go to this meeting this CEO meeting because he wasn't done with his pieces. He wasn't done with his essays. It all had to be put together and collated. Anyway, I was going to have to back out of the CEO meeting if I was going to help my son finish all of this, all of these applications. And I was like, I, I can't believe this is like the biggest opportunity I've ever had in my career. And this is the way I thought of it. And, but my son is only applying to college once. And I spoke to my HR person and I said, what happens if I back out and I don't go? And they said, well, that would be career limiting for you. Um, you <laughs> get asked once, I can't tell you if you're ever gonna get asked again. And in fact, you can't just back out, you have to get permission from the CEO to back out. <laughs> and you know, this was really stressful. And I actually, I actually sat back for a second and I said, wow, this is the first time I'm actually having one of those work life moments, you know, that you read about and, you know, you, you make decisions all the time. Like I'm going to, you know, stop working so I can go to a baseball game and, you know, I'll come back, I'll work late, you know, or I'm, I'm flying to a meeting. I'll try to be back. You know, you make all those decisions, but this was like, wow, I really have to choose between my family and my career. I, well, I, I, you know, I didn't know what to do, you know, and I thought about it a little bit and then I decided I only have one, you know, I had one son. Uh, he's only applying to college once, hopefully, and I, <laughs> or I, I had to do it. I had to back out of the CEO forum and, and do it. So anyway. I backed out. There was, you know, I heard all kinds of, you know, repercussions that I heard about. Um, but as soon as I made that decision, you know, family first, when I realized as soon as I made that decision, it, it, I knew it was right. I knew I went with the right gut reaction. And I'm happy to say f several months later, um, I was invited again to another CEO forum. <laughs> so the, the earth didn't, you know, the, the sky didn't fall. My son got into Juilliard, by the way. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and going to the CEO forum was actually a turning point in my career because I was invigorated. I made the right decision. I stuck to what I felt was right. And the idea that I brought to the CEO was that we have an independent group within our company, internal, but independent from, from every other group, from commercial, from R&D, from quality, from legal, that would be responsible for all of the tough decisions and evaluations. And what I included in that was safety, epidemiology, and the ethical decision-making that we have to make as a company sometimes. 
And we, so I proposed that. I wrote my, uh, my proposal to the CEO. It was discussed at the forum, and I didn't hear anything about it for about a year. Then we had a new CEO, and I was called to his office. And it turned out that they actually had discussed my proposal, and they decided to create, for the first time, a chief medical officer for J&J. &J, and they asked me to create that role and to take that job. So it ended up being the, probably the most important thing from a career perspective that I had ever done. And I really felt that it was important, not just having safety, but also having epidemiology. Because epidemiology, it seems, might seem to some people like it's a science and it's analytic and you know, what difference does it make to be independent? But I think many of you know, just deciding sometimes what studies to do and what studies not to do, to be sure that there's not bias, to assure transparency, sharing data, making sure that you're sharing your, the code and analysis plans, posting studies, not just clinical studies, but epidemiology studies before the analysis is done so you can assure other people that you've predefined your analyses. All of those principles are incredibly important. And that's why we have epidemiology as part of this internal independent group within J&J, &J, along with safety and ethics and policy. I think that the most important lessons that I learned from a career perspective and a leadership perspective is first to be a person. Yes, you have a family, you have a life, and that is really important. And from a leadership perspective, it takes some of the things I heard from, from most of the other women here. Vision, integrity, so critical, collaboration, and tenacity. I tell my team sometimes, I eat nails for breakfast. I won't let, if something is really important, I will not let it go. And some of these initiatives take years. I know Harlan Krumholtz is here in the audience together. We did the Yoda data sharing agreement together. It took quite a while. It took a while for in, on both of our levels to come to a great place. But now we're openly sharing our data with researchers all over the world from pharmaceutical clinical trials, medical device studies, as well as consumer studies, consumer clinical studies. We share those data too. We're the only company that does that. And I'm very proud of that. Well, it's important for us to support women in science and the science of women's health. And to achieve this vision, I want to announce that we will be working together with Columbia and Odyssey to develop ways to support the women of Odyssey and the science of women in a meaningful way to deliver both a program of research in women's health, as well as to support more women to enter the field of data analytics. So stay tuned for updates as we work together to progress in these important areas. Let me just thank each and every one of you, men and women, for joining us tonight, and especially thank these amazing women on the podium. I wish everyone to have a great Odyssey Symposium. Use this time to network and meet other people. It's an invaluable opportunity. This community is vitally important to advancing data analytics and creating a world in which observational, observational research produces a comprehensive understanding of health and disease and can really contribute and play a huge role in building a learning healthcare system, in changing medicine and science together. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that, Joanne. Um, so we have time now for a short uh, Q&A session. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, I invite you to uh, come up to the microphone in the, the aisle there. Um, and to kick off the, the Q&A session, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, to each one of our speakers, um, I heard a lot of really great advice on leadership tonight. Um, so for each one of you, uh, I wanted to know, for, what, what, what would your number one piece of advice be for a young woman entering or, or starting her career today? Um, Noemi, do you want to start? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yep. nice. Um, 
I guess seek mentors is really uh, is really my first advice and doesn't have to be a woman. It has to be someone who's supportive of who you are and is able to train you as a as a rigorous scientist, really. But I think specifically for people who are from a diverse background, it's going to make a difference. Well, I will say, I don't know if this one is on. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. I would say follow your dreams. It doesn't matter, you know, if you are at the beginning of your career and if you find the time when you like to change something, do it with no fear. I don't think there is time that will limit anything that you dream or you like to do. So follow your dreams. On a more practical note, <laughs> I'd say do something you're good at because you'll enjoy it more. Okay, I started out in chemistry. I was terrible in chemistry. Okay, well, I don't like it either. You know, chemistry. So <laughs> that's right. Well, I was an analytical chemist. It's like, oh my god, when is it going to be five o'clock? So, uh, so, but I found you know um, first medicine, but then actually sort of leadership was. Mm -hmm. was what I was good at and and if you're good at something then you know you'll do it better so to speak and it'll be easier and um, then you can follow your dreams because you've definitely <laughs> got to do that well you know if I can you know just uh, say something regardless follow your dream my daughter I thought my daughter is going to become a physician my myself and my husband are physicians so I thought you know she would follow the same steps and she started to say, maybe she'll do, you know, she'll go to medical school. Then she decided, no, she said, maybe she'll be a dentist. She did take the test. She did go to interview. And then she came home after she was accepted to tell me that actually that's not your, her dream. So she said, I really want to be a pharmacist. And she followed her dream, which, you know, like John, I thought that's the end of the world because she followed all these years trying to get something. And at the end of the day, she said, that's my dream. And now she's a pharmacist and she loves what she does. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, so I have very similar advice. Uh, you know, we spend so much time at work. <laughs> Find something that you really love. Be sure you really love it. I agree with following your dreams. I also wanted my son to be a doctor. <laughs> and when he told me he wanted to be a musician, as my sister knows, we tried to convince him not to. We thought it'd be great. We'll pay for lessons for you while you're studying to do something else. But he was determined, you know, and I, and I think that's great. And I think you should follow your dreams, be the person that you are. If you don't feel comfortable, that if you feel that the place that you're working won't let you speak up and be yourself, they don't deserve you, you know, work somewhere where you can speak up, where you can be yourself and, and follow your dreams. All right, that's some great career and life advice. <laughs> All right, uh, Keys, you got a question? Yes. Well, thank you for, for this uh, forum. I, I'm really enjoying it a lot. <laughs> Thanks for putting that together. It's a great idea. Um, my question is for Janet. You said something that the next step in biomedical science has to be about collaboration. It's kind of a non-controversial statement to make, I guess, in this audience <laughs> of Odyssey. Um, but when we tie that into leadership, how do, we think, how do you think we as Odyssey can really make a difference in also leading the world? Because from where I stand, um, we have a lot of great leaders in this community. We have a lot of vision, a lot of things to say but it's still more or less a well-kept secret overall. You can make your biggest mark by being successful, by doing what you're trying to do really well, and people will have to pay attention. Believe me, I've been beating my head against this wall for about 20 years maybe, uh, <laughs> over, you know, we have to change how we do science and really, Nobody really listens to me, I would say. <laughs> no, really. It's better now. Like, I gave that lecture in L.A. Uh, a week ago, and people actually listened to me. Um, but a couple years ago, I gave what's called the Shattuck Lecture to the New England Journal. And, you know, I didn't even publish it because I just was looking at a sea of blank faces. So I agree that determination, tenacity, and persistence is really important. But success is even more important. Um, you know, because a lot of things have to change. The physics community, for example, has um, 
successfully adopted big science because they had to. And with like detection of gravitational waves and also it's becoming, it's very successful in their telescopes and all the different stuff they're doing, <laughs> you know? So um, I think, you know, you have to make a mark. Otherwise um, you will, not be recognized by the mainstream because that's just how humans are. They have trouble changing their point of view about things. So um, success might mean many different things, but it uh, might mean, you know, being able to adopt some of this work uh, for regulatory purposes. It might mean um, being able to change public health mm -hmm. practice through uh, what we have learned and so forth. But when those results become actionable, then people are going to pay attention. Thank you. Right. <laughs> well, of course, I was admiring the work of Odyssey and, and Patrick and the rest of the team since they started. Um, it was quite amazing I could voice the problems that I was seeing. For example, now <clears throat> we need to start using the common data models to start yes. to capture data and avoid any data transformation that makes, it only incorporates errors. I, um, it was difficult to implement safety data mining. There was a violent opposition. I wish I would have had violent opposition, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I thought that people wanted to strangle me <laughs> within the industry and also within the TA. Yeah, and I wish, and then I had, I thought that I have two options. One was um, to keep working and not pay attention. And the other is to start fighting with people that I didn't want to do that. I learned from coaching that I should have, I had other options. I needed to think about win-win situations. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what people can, for example, now the statisticians, the, the clinical trials, they may have seven million rows of laboratory data easily. Well, it can take months to actually organize the data and we clearly understand the data much better if we are looking at organized data. But statisticians at FDA, they were afraid. Then suddenly I started thinking, well, look at the opportunities that we are missing. To be Patients are waiting. <coughs> we cannot spend several months to start analyzing the laboratory data. Uh, when we can have a machine generate, if we have interoperable data, then can be generated in, in a few hours, and then we can all understand the data together. But I think we need to think about options to improve communication that I was not thinking. Um. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. Um, I actually have two questions. So my first question is actually to all of you. So as you've gone through your careers and have experienced either discrimination or bias or kind of negative experiences where you've been either passed up for promotions or pay raises and so on, how have you channeled those experiences and shaped and informed how you lead your teams today? <laughs> Well, I will, let's, I will try. Um, I don't think there is such thing as a very smooth path with no bumps in the roads. There are always. Um, I think a few things that have been said about small successes that you can escalate to another level or we can make out of those as another dreams to follow. 
to have uh, win-wins, to know how to seize the right moment whenever you like to promote something that you believe in, to be a champion. And I don't think there is anything as a success or a partnership that was successful without having a champion. And being a champion, it takes that acceptance that you are not going to be always the one visible and front lead. You are not going to be the only one receiving positive feedback. Again, you are going to be the one facing all this sometimes negative feedback. But you have to know, you have to believe in first place in that thing that you like to accomplish. And if you are a true champion, you just dust off everything, any negative things that are against you and you just move on. And if I think in my life, I had many experiences like this. I remember as of today, when I became OBGYN resident, I was the first woman resident in that place. And I'm talking about, I was born in Romania and I, was, I had medical school in one side of the country and then I practiced in the other side. The other side was very different. It was very close to Hungary, Austria, I had this Western European um, influences, but this was still male driven. And I was the only one. What do you think I heard the very first day? I said, good luck, I was told. If you can do it, that would be great, but we haven't had women, so very likely you are going to say you like to do another speciality. Oh, well, for a week, I was on call, I was in OR, I was doing all this, and I never, I had nights when I didn't even sit down. But I made it because I truly believed in what I wanted to do. And I thought I would be a champion leading women to this place, right? And I had similar experience moving forward. I had the same experience at some point that I was doing the very first ovarian stimulation protocol that nobody believed is going to work when I was in England. I worked on studies with you know, WHO whenever people say we cannot do these studies on contraception. But I believed in those things. So I believed if I am a good champion, I have to make it. Yeah, it took a little more effort. But again, if you believe in it, at the end of the day, the success is yours. I, I'll just add just some practical information. Um, so I have had the experience where I've been asked to take on more responsibility, like almost a second job on top of my current job. And I came home and I told my husband, you know, I, I told them I would accept this additional work. Uh, and he said, oh, how much are you, you know, how much is your raise? <laughs> yeah, I said, no, I'm, I'm sure that they'll compensate me somehow. So I, I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, you realize sometimes by things like that happening. And my husband, you know, for him, it was like an immediate right, yeah. reaction. Like, yeah. of course, you should have asked for that uh -huh. like before you even accepted. And, you know, I, I've read a little bit <laughs> <laughs> that other women have uh, very That's similar amazing. experiences. And um, in fact, I had never even asked, not just for a promotion, I had never asked for a raise, I had never asked for anything Same. like that. Yeah, so okay. Never asked for a raise. So, um, so I think we have to learn from our learned colleagues <laughs> who have a different instinctual gut reaction um, and practice. Um, so I, you know, if you have a difficult conversation that you feel is important, practice it with your friend yeah. mm -hmm. or a colleague or someone good, and then go in and have that conversation. And after that happened to me, and by the way, my husband is still mad at me, even though it was like 10 years ago, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> he reminds me of it all the time. But um, <laughs> after that happened to me, I, I committed that I will never let that happen again. And also I tell all of the women and men that I work with that, you know, we, I try to help them avoid that situation as well. Um, it's, so yeah. I hope that's helpful. For me, I mean, I spent a lot of time angry, to be really <laughs> honest. <laughs> and uh, finally, I got an executive coach, and they, they taught me a bunch of different things to deal with that, um, like writing a letter to the person you're angry with and then burning it. <laughs> <laughs> really well <laughs> like practicing the difficult conversations <laughs> I was mainly you know my I, I never really asked for promotions or raises either but I was mainly angry because I didn't think people were doing things right you know I still I'm still in that place uh, but um, I think not getting angry and uh, I think I've gotten beyond that and learning to like 
figure out, like Anna was saying, what are my options? How do I deal with this situation? What are good options? What are win-wins? What, how can I make this into a, you know, a positive experience? Don't take it personally. It usually is never personal. It's just how everybody thinks. You know, you give a woman an opportunity, they should just be really grateful, right? <laughs> Not ask for more money. <laughs> so, or you, you know, you feel like your idea. I've been in that situation so many times like you know nobody's listening to you they don't you know pay any attention well you just got to figure out i'm probably not presenting it in a way okay that it's that those people can accept the change in the framing of the issue that i'm i'm pushing or whatever so so that's that's my my advice is really don't take it personally because i agree yes. it's going to happen to everybody all humans this will happen to and it'll probably happen to women probably more if they're in certain fields than than otherwise but um if you take it personally then you're just going to stew and be unhappy and thwarted and everything so f find a way to deal with your anger or disappointment or whatever it might be and just move ahead yeah, I, I would add to this that I actually have found anger to be a wonderful motivator. For better things. Yeah. My, my advisor, when we had rejections and we had many, uh, would always say, you know, they, they did not understand and we have to make them understand. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's how you do it. You just get a thicker and thicker skin yeah. and uh, try not to ruminate and just yeah. move on. But keep that little anger in you to... <laughs> Uh, you know, feel like you want to you want to keep working on it. Um, but I, I want to add also that it's not like there is a textbook on how to be, you know, amazing at this. Like it's it's a you know, I think it's tough for everyone. And these things happen, as everyone else said. Cool. Um, that's it. I can let you ask your question. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Oh. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Erica Voss, and I feel like forums like this are really where we take time to talk about how women should function in a men's environment. And um, one of the things I think a lot about is I started my career in IT. So my undergrad at Penn State, I was with all guys. And when I started at j and J, I I I was with all guys. And when I started in epidemiology, there were women. And I didn't know how to interface with women. So um, I thought it was easier to actually work with men. So I was actually wondering, because it feels like you guys had similar situations where you were coming up and there weren't a lot of men in your undergraduate or graduate. So I was wondering if you have stories or thoughts on that matter. <laughs> or is that just a random question? <laughs> no, I just, for some reason, this is not going to answer your question, but when you said that, it just reminded me in my engineering school in undergrad. Um, I was pretty good, uh, and we had about 60 students uh, and two women. And each time our, this one professor would uh, you know, give his slides, he would come to us literally one after the other, the two women, and be like, did you get it? And so, um, so, you know, so I, it didn't happen once I was with more women around me. No one asked me if I got it, and that was nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I don't know if I answered your question either, but um, I remember when I was, let's say, when I, I gave the example whenever there were only men actually becoming OBGYN and it was new. But then I remember when I had to do reproductive endocrinology, only men were doing embryology. Wherever I've been, I haven't met a woman, there were only men. But then that changed over time. And actually, whenever I had to do other things, they were related to the same field, but not in the clinical practice. And I got to work with clinics and develop another initiative. Whenever I did reach to clinics, I found women, actually, more women being embryologists. And I should say sometimes I found it difficult, actually, to connect with some women. And I found easier to connect with men. So I don't think it's a rule, you know, like what we say or a standard. Um, I mentioned my mentors, they were women, but I had like two mentors who were men. And one of them in particular was embodied everything you can think of a man, like being very polite, very educated, teaching us knowing even how to tell us, you know, like whenever we haven't done something right, he knew how to approach it, not to make us feel bad or not to know what to do. So um, I don't think, I think it's more of a feeling or personal approach. And I should say for me, pretty much every single time it was like finding the right niche or the right moment and the right way to break that, you know, like whenever I had to deal with either one women or men.
But I agree with you, sometimes it could be either or. I don't think it's always when you are surrounded by women, everything is nice and good, right? So <laughs> it's true, it's, I experienced myself. But as a woman, you know, I gave the example whenever I had in my mind that I have to succeed and I have to prove that women are equal and, you know, <laughs> women can know and do, so. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, we're all subject to the same cultural problems or societal um, uh, influences. And in male-dominated professions, uh, that women pioneers often um, have to take on that protective coloration, okay, of hyper competitiveness, yeah. hyper competency, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, I have found, or some of them take on sort of the little girl, like, get everybody to protect me kind of stuff, right? And these are all, and we have to have empathy for those people because they have not developed the thickest skin possible, or they, that's their coping mechanism for the situation they found themselves in. So I think um, that you will encounter that, and as society becomes um, more accepting of diversity and sort of more relaxed about all this stuff, the other, you know, or, and also what kind of behavior you must have and what the business environment or the, you know, academic environment, then it will become easier. But I think always you need to have empathy and then that will help you figure out how to connect with those people, whatever, understand what they went through in their life experience that caused them to interact in a way. Uh, but I've certainly encountered a lot of women who've been, um, who've really had to grow protective armor of one sort or another because of their uh, professional experiences. Yeah, I'll just add, I think, I think those are very insightful comments. I'll just add, I think when I started in um, industry uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, <laughs> a couple of decades ago, you know, it was very clear, like work, family, separate. You mm -hmm. don't mix yeah. the yeah, two. Absolutely. And I, th you know, that was the way it was. And I also had a coach who helped me grow as a leader. I've had several of them. I'm a work in progress. Um, <laughs> but uh, she really encouraged me to, you know, like share a little bit, be more authentic, be yourself, you know. And I was like, well, you know, but I think that is something that as more women and more diversity has come into the workforce, I personally feel mm -hmm. that that has really enabled me as well as other people to just, you know, live. I, I say I live the big mishmash of work and family. As you could tell from my story, it's all one big mishmash. I have is no separation at all. You know, my family hears me on teleconferences. My work people hear me, you know, talking about family or home or, or issues. Um, and I think that I think that that's a much healthier environment and allows us to be authentic in front of each other and allows more empathy and allows us to be more human. And, and I, I think it's it's much better, a much healthier way to, to be. I will say Joanne has been in a tough environment. I was at a meeting. I was the only woman in the room. That he <laughs> leaders of industry, right? Leaders of government and me. And yeah. thankfully, Joanne came and made a presentation. And there were two women. That was just in the spring, last That's spring. Right. <laughs> I said something, didn't I? I think I said something. You might have. I was really glad to see you. <laughs> Thank you. So men can cook and life work balance is different today. Yeah. That would be a conclusion, right? <laughs>Thank you everyone for joining us this evening and thank you Noemi, Violanda, Janet and Joanne for your uh, very engaging thought provoking talks. Um, so the women of Odyssey actually uh, have a thank you gift for you for joining us tonight. Um, we've got some woo t-shirts. So oh, nice. Honorary nice. members. <laughs> I'll make sure to wear it. <laughs> thank All you. Right. Yes. Thank you everyone. Thank you. And there's some coffee.